Hello, everybody, and happy Friday. Does anybody else do a little dance when that music is playing in the countdown? Ellie and I always do a little a little dance, and it's delightful. I don't, I don't know. It's Friday. It's Friday. Um, it's been such an incredible week, actually. We've had a really great week at Find My Past. I hope that all of you have had a fantastic week as well. In the comments section, let us know who you are and where you're watching from. It's been a while since I've been on, so this is really fun. Um, I was supposed to be on last week, but I was at Roots Tech in Salt Lake City, so Ellie covered for me. Thank you so much, Ellie, again. You're a star. Um, and I've just been kind of buried in a big research project the last few weeks, so um, it's great to be with you guys. Um, it's, been a, it's been a little bit too long. I think I needed this. Um, so hello, Terry from Glasgow. Thank you so much. Ellie is in the comments with us today, so please say hi to Ellie. Andrew says it's um, lovely and sunny here in Lancashire. Um, 12C with blue skies. That sounds nice. And your snow is gone. That's fantastic as well. I know that feeling. Uh, Daphne's here in Somerset. Um, oh, a lost screw in her craft room. Daphne, I hope you find it because um, that is always the most irritating thing, right? With When you find you missing just one piece. Uh, so, yes. I, I really, yeah, I feel for you. <laughs> feel for you, Daphne. Um, Karen's here with us in North London. It's good to see you, Karen. Oh, it's nice, Daphne, that you asked after me. That's so sweet of you. Um, Sarah, welcome back. Thank you, Sarah. Um, from Wexford, let's see. Um, Gina's in Lincolnshire. S snow's all, it sounds like most of the snow is gone. Oh, nope. West Yorkshire still has some snow, Kim says. Um, let's see. And in Cambridgeshire, surely. Um, okay, doing all right, right? <laughs> yeah. Karen says the music makes her slightly nervous because she's remembering sitting in that moment, waiting for the camera to go live um, before her appearance. That I have that feeling too, but it's always like a little bit of like energy enthused, I think, into the room. Um, let's see. Judith is in Melbourne. Jenny's in Devon. Um, cutting leather. That's something I've never attempted. Okay. Um, uh, and then another Jenny in Norfolk. Lots of Jens and Jennies today. Yes. Loving that. That's cool. Um, okay. Oh, and Ellie says more snow with her mom in North Wales than she's had up in Scotland. Um, so that's a first. So everybody write that down in your diaries. <laughs> All right. I, um, I am, like I said, I'm just back from Roots Tech. Um, and it, I'm, we're going to do a little bit of a Roots Tech recap today, but let me tell you guys, I haven't felt this enthused and energetic about my own personal research in actually quite a while. I've been in a little bit of a slump. I've been trying to work through a pretty tough problem um, and it's been getting a little frustrating. So going to RootStack was just a really amazing break and a chance to reconnect with people that I haven't seen in a long time. And it was just good to get the energy of the community again and have that kind of face-to-face -face interaction. So it was really, really great. Um, I hope that all of you had a chance to kind of follow along on social media if you weren't there with us in Utah. Um, uh, watch some of the sessions that are available. There's some really incredible speakers. Of course, the Find My Past speakers are all your favorites. We know that already. It's cool. Um, but uh, we did have we did have a really great time. We had a small team there and we have some really funny pictures and it was great. <laughs> so um, if you get the chance to attend an in-person event, uh, and you haven't done so yet um, since the pandemic, I would encourage you to do so. This is this was my first big genealogy event actually since the pandemic. Um, so it was it was really great actually. It was great to just connect with people and have that energy in the room. Um, so it was good. Yeah. And who's got the carrot cake? Uh, Karen does, and she is going to save us all some carrot cake. Thank you, Karen. All right. Uh, we have a lot to talk about today. Um, some really cool new, new records coming out. Um, but the And the question of the week has been posted. Um, but we are going to do a little bit more on that theme of women's research. I know Ellie covered it last week. Um, so we're just going to keep on that a little bit, kind of celebrating and honoring International Women's Day, um, which of course was just this past week. We had um, three sessions that were conducted for us internally at Find My Past, which was really great. We learned a lot this week about about, um, some, you know, a variety of issues, um, not just women's history, but also just, you know, like biology and all sorts of great topics were covered. So a big shout out to our Find My Past team for setting that up for us. Um, and if you want to know more about those types of things that we do in the, in the kind of the Find My Past ecosystem, check out our LinkedIn page. Um, 
because uh, we post all sorts of stuff over on LinkedIn about how we operate as a business. Um, and it might be interesting for some of you because you are all part of the Find My Pass family and we want you to know what we're doing, um, both you know, from a research perspective, but also just a, as a company and, and as a community. Um, so um, yeah, lots to catch up on from RootSec still for sure, Karen, me too. Um, Georgia saying she loved RootSec online, that's great. It's, it's always good to get that feedback too and, and understand what's working um, out there in the space and what's not. So um, it was interesting to hear about how, how or if RootStack plans to kind of continue to do that hybrid model. It sounds like they probably will. Um, it looks like it's being pretty successful for them. That was kind of the tone that you got from, from FamilySearch folks. Um, they also gave a little hint that they're considering um, Find My Pass London, or sorry, Find My Pass, RootStack London again. Um, they said they were looking at it. And there's actually, I watched a video on YouTube yesterday from one of the RootStack ambassadors that asked that exact question. Um, so so it's worth kind of paying attention to the roots tech side of things and seeing if they're going to come back uh, to the UK and do something, which we would love, right? Right? That would be incredible. It would be awesome. Um, okay. So um, Ellie, thanks for sharing our LinkedIn page. That's lovely. Um, Jenny missed Roots Tech Live because she had a birthday. So happy birthday, Jenny. I think that's your birthday, not someone else's birthday. Um, but happy birthday to whoever it was in your world that had a birthday, Jenny. Um, all right, question of the week. Um, let's put it up on the screen so people can see it. So the question today is, have you uncovered kind of a unique story about a family, a female ancestor, perhaps something that's kind of non-traditional or groundbreaking, or, you know, did they, did they do a little bit of glass ceiling shattering? Um, I have a lot of experience with glass shattering today. Actually, I have a very funny story about myself and my milk jug exploding in my refrigerator because it froze. Uh, and it was a big mess this morning. It's not quite the glass I'm talking about though with our female ancestors. Um, uh, I've been making really bad milk jokes all day so far. And Ellie, has been the victim of those jokes. <laughs> um, so have you uncovered a unique story about your females? Um, and, and that could be, you know, something that you're just interested in. It could be a relative. It could be um, kind of your fan research, right? So think about that. Share some of your discoveries in the chat. And, and let's see if we can dredge up some cool stories. I have been milking it all day, Anya. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I literally am gonna I'm gonna laugh about the milk thing probably for the rest of the weekend. Uh, okay, let's talk about our new records this week. Um, there are some really good ones and I'm excited about them. So the first one is from Lancashire. Um, so for all of you who said you are watching from Lancashire, this one's for you. Um, and that is the Barrow and Furnace Shipbuilding and Engineering Employees. This is actually a really cool record set. I just started to dig, dig into it yesterday and the day before. It stretches from the 1870s to the 1960s. So it covers both world wars, which is really cool. It is an index only. There's no images here, but um, but provided by um the um, Barrow, Barrow, sorry, I said that wrong, Archive and Local Study Center, um, part of the Cumbria Archive. So some really cool and interesting pieces. It really includes two record sets. Um, it's women employed by vicars in industrial and non-industrial roles um, during World War I. There's about 1,300 records of those, and most of them were teenagers, which I actually found to be really interesting, right? Um, and then the second piece of it is staff and apprentices at the shipyard itself from the 1890s to the 1950s. That's men and women. Um, and that does include some records from that World War II period. Um, so you get the opportunity to kind of study that aspect of um, economics and industry and how occupations were changing uh, uh, and the, the impact of both wars kind of all at the same time. So it's a really great set. Um, please make sure that if you find anything cool that you are um, that you are sharing that with us because we, we love to hear those stories. I just did a quick look to see what I could find. And I found uh, a young lady, Jane Cassells, uh, in the index. In the index, she's 17 years old. She's, the, she's listed in 1918. So just at the, you know, kind of at the eve of the, or the end of the World War I period, she's working in the ordnance department as a shop assistant. So then, of course, I couldn't help but like, you know, what happens to Jane, right? So I went to the 1921 census and she has moved back into a much more stereotypical female position. She's a parlor maid in the home of a local vicar. So she goes from like this, this work where she's working in the ordinance department and she's 
you know, engaged in work that women just have never done before. Um, and then, you know, and then suddenly finds herself back into domestic service. So it really speaks to this idea of how women contributed to the war effort. Um, and then, and then kind of as the men start to come home, they kind of revert back to these traditional roles. And there's a lot of that give and take over this period, obviously, during the interwar period, because this is the first time that that those roles have really shifted in that way. So there's a lot of kind of ebb and flow to that story. Um, and and it's I just think it's really interesting, right? It's really interesting uh, perspective on social history and being able to actually see that history kind of come alive through these individuals. Um, so that's the first record set is that um, Lancashire shipbuilding and engineering employees. The second one is one that I think is um, eye-opening, I suppose, especially for someone who's you know, not local, right? Um, I don't have a local British community or, or Welsh or Scottish or Irish to really kind of sink my teeth into as a researcher. Um, so this is a, a project that, um, that we found online a few months ago. Um, and it's actually the, um, it's a website called Open Plaques. Um, so what we've done is publish the United Kingdom list that they have um, of commi commemorative plaques. That's hard for me to say. Um, and this is an open source project. So the whole intent of this project is for people like you and me to wander around the countryside and take pictures of all of the plaques that are just all over the UK, right? Um, and I'm, every time I go over, I'm amazed at how many of these things there are, right? There's the famous blue plaques, but there's all sorts of other colors. And I don't really know the designation of the other colors, but Ellie's nodding her head. She doesn't know either, but I've seen green ones and I think maybe a purple one. I don't know. Anyway, so their idea is to kind of collect this massive global database of all of these historic plaques that are everywhere. So they have um, a database that covers every major country in the world, which is incredible. So they've got, you know, we just did the UK, um, but they've also got the United States and Canada and um, uh, locations across Australia and, and South Africa or Africa as a whole, like all over Europe. It's an incredible collection and it's all crowdsourced. So that's the part that I really loved about, about it the most is that people just like you and me are wandering around taking pictures and submitting these plaques. Um, so I would invite you to actually check out the website and participate in this process. It's really neat um, because they do take volunteers globally. Um, and that then the more you and I contribute, the better the collection will become on Find My Past because we'll update on, on a consistent basis now. Um, and and it will just grow, right? The whole the whole list will just grow. It's such a really cool way to do house history. Like I just, I love the um, the idea of bringing in the history of the plaque and, and the building. Um, so what we've published this week is oh, United Kingdom commemorative plaques. There are just over to well, almost 13,000 entries on the list today. Uh, a significant number of them, of course, are places, not necessarily people. But again, with that interest in kind of local history, one place studies, house history, um, always kind of thinking about the the area and arena in which our ancestors lived. It's It's a perfect melding of what we do and and, and what this project is trying to accomplish. Um, so some of the people obviously have a lot of entries, like, right? So like Dickens has over 50 entries in the system. So it's not kind of restricted or anything. You can submit anything you want, even if it's repetitive. So just be aware of that. Then of course, some entries are very unique, right? Um, so I wanted to share one of the examples that I found. Actually, I found two that I thought were kind of cool. Um, so the first was a, a woman named um, Lady May Baird, who I had actually never heard of before, um, but actually has quite an interesting story. Um, she was designated as a social pioneer, and that's why she has a plaque. Um, her plaque is at 38 Albion Place in Aberdeen. Um, she was a town councillor. She was the first woman to hold the position of chair for a regional hospital board. Um, and she was also national governor of the BBC from 1965 to 1971. So really cool, right? Like she's got quite a story. The other plaque that I found is an Elizabeth Bentley who was born in 1767. Right. You all, you guys know I love kind of the, those older centuries. Um, so I had to dig up somebody from the 1700s. She lived at 45 St. Stephen's Square in Norwich. Um, and she's the she's an author. She wrote Tales for Children in Verse. That is her publication. And that's why she has a plaque. So, of course, I wanted to know more about 
um, this particular location and her. So I spent a little time just reading up on her, but what really captured me was her house history, right? So she's at 45 St. Stephen's Square in Norwich. Um, if you move to the address search on Find My Past, um, you'll, and, and, and get that, you'll find in 1851 that the house was occupied by a player and his wife, who was also an actress. In 1861, it's occupied by a draper who's originally from Scotland um, and his family. Um, and then it looks like it sat empty maybe in 71. And then 81 um, was a, a kind of a mixed family that needed more time in research. So skip ahead to 1901. And there's a widow living there on her own means um, with her son, who's a chemist assistant, uh, and a boarder who is a female um, school teacher. In 1911, the widow's still there. Um, the son is gone, but now her daughter is living there. And the interesting thing there is that the daughter has a very similar name to the school teacher and boarder from 1901. And the daughter is also a teacher. So it got me like, maybe these are actually the same woman, but something's, you know, something happened, right? Very, very similar name requires a bit more invest investigation, but it's, it's going on my list of interesting things to look at. And then, of course, 1921, if we move ahead, you know, 10 more years, um, the house is now occupied by a cashier um, for the, the baths there and is listed as head of household. But she's it's her name is Margaret. Um, she's living with another woman, Mary Jane, who is listed as a joint occupier, um, not a border, not a relation, just a, they kind of designated their own title for this other woman, Mary Jane. And Mary Jane works as, get this, a designer of crackers and bonbons. I want that job and I want to be Margaret who gets to presumably, I, I assume and hope, taste test all of Mary Jane's new bonbon products because yes, I want to live with someone who designs bonbons. That sounds amazing. <laughs> so you just never know what you're going to find when you do this kind of process of of house history. And it didn't, it doesn't take very long, right? I, I probably wrote all that up in about 15 minutes because the address search on Find My Past makes it so easy to find these little tidbits and find these people. So um, yeah, so just some cool stories there. But when you use this data set, the commemorative plaques, um, really be aware of the search fields because there are so many places versus names in this collection. Um, you want to really take advantage of the keyword search box that's on the search page for the collection um, and filter those the list to kind of sites that are relevant to your research or of interest to you. So between the keyword and the location filters, you should be able to find a really interesting combination of buildings that have plaques in the area of interest. So it's a really nice and a little social history addition to the site this week. Um, so I hope you guys are excited about it uh, as well. And I hope um, that you use it a lot because I fully intend to see if we can get the list published for Australia, New Zealand, Canada, United States, and, and all of the other areas that we work in. So um, it would be really great to see everybody kind of engage with this record set and dig out some cool stories. Oh, bonbons can be Christmas crackers, not edible. Oh, Georgia. You just like threw water all over. <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, okay, that's going on my list of words um, that are different between the UK and the US. Uh, Ellie, don't let me forget to look that one up because um, I do have a running list. Uh, but that's good to know. Christmas crackers, not at all. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Christmas crackers are still fun. So um, I will still buy them every year and I will still put my crown on. So I'll, I'll take it. I'll it's still good. It's still a good occupation. Okay, um, newspapers this week. Um, we actually are taking just a short little break on publishing newspapers. Um, and that is we because we are undertaking some kind of essential maintenance um, and preparing the site a little bit for some even more rich historical newspaper content, right? So we're taking a little break from publishing so we can work on some stuff kind of on the back end. You probably won't see any of that or feel the impact of that, but know that it's helping us um, be able to provide kind of a steady stream of newspaper publication for you in, over the next several months. So just be aware that that um, is happening and there's no new newspapers this week as a result. All right. Um, ooh, let me go back to comments and see what you guys are talking about. Um, 
Oh, namer of clouds. Are you kidding me? That's so cool. In Tottenham, Luke Howard, namer of clouds, 7072 to 1864. That's really neat, Karen. I love it. Um, Anya says there's some cool plaques in Dundee, including a bitch who was well known in local history. Those are good. Um, I got some question of the week. We'll get to those in just a few minutes. Um, oh, and Andrew already found uh, one of his family in Barrow. He was at a coal mine in Whitehaven in 1939. That's very cool. I close my email really quick, so I'll stop getting those little notifications because they're distracting. Um, okay. Oh, Anya, one of your cousins has a plaque dedicated to her in, oh, I can't pronounce those things, in a museum. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do go on a lot about Dr. Mary Lee Edward, though. But as you should, that's really cool. That is really neat. So I love this stuff. Um, it's fantastic. Oh, and Jenny's, Jenny to the rescue here. They may have been edibles. There's a chocolate factory in Norwich, <laughs> very near St. Stephen's. Awesome. I'm going to go ahead and go, keep talking about bonbons like they're chocolate. All right. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, yeah. All right, good. Um, thanks for those comments. Keep them coming. Uh, love to hear all of that. Um, okay. I want to give a quick little shout out to someone who made a very nice comment this week. Um, to the Find My Past team, and we thought it was really special. And actually, um, I, I will admit, you kind of um, maybe got something in our eyes a little when you said this, just a little bit. Um, Catherine um, made a comment. Kath can I say her surname? Is that okay? Catherine Broom um, said after last week's talk, or this this week's talk, I'm sorry. It was on Tuesday, right, Ellie? When's Thursday. Wednesday. I don't know. It was someday this week. <laughs> um, Catherine said, thank you so much for this afternoon's talk on the new Legacies of British Slavery Records. I watch every Friday afternoon. It's my high spot of the week being a 91-year-old uh, and rather housebound genealogy addict. Um, Catherine, that was one of the most incredible comments we've had in a while. And we just really wanted to say thank you. Uh, for watching, but also for telling us. Um, I'm I'm trying not to tear up literally right now. Um, we really just found that to be really special, and um, and we wanted to acknowledge it and and let you know that even if you don't comment on a regular basis, but you're here watching with us, um, we appreciate you so very much, all of you. Um, this community is incredible. I and I um, at Rootstack, I heard a couple of people. Um, specifically actually come to me and say, um, this, this thing that you're doing, this find my past from home is so important. Um, and it's become kind of a, a known and respected thing across the industry, I guess. Um, I had a couple of other speakers who were like, yeah, this is what you guys are doing over here is really important and impactful. Um, and we couldn't do any of that without all of you, uh, right? We could, we would just be sitting here talking to ourselves if you weren't tuning in every week. Uh, and it means the world to us that you actually do tune in every week and you watch regularly. And for those of you who comment regularly or just watch regularly, like it, we, I, I just can't, I don't know the words. I really don't know the words to tell you how, how special that is. Um, so Thank you very much, Catherine, for making the comment. And thank you to all of you for being a part of this because it really, it would be nothing if it weren't for you. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna stop now because, because <laughs> it's just, it's so much, it's so much. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's kind of crazy, right? We all work for the, the Find My Pest team. We work for a company. Like obviously we have business objectives, but what we do is so incredible and, and so special. And we get to be a part of something that's so much bigger than just like, I don't know, selling cars or um, making, writing utensils or something. I don't know. Uh, it's just, it's really, it's really awesome. Okay, um, that's enough of that. <laughs> um, this one, this looks like a good comment. Let's read this. Hi from a cold Normandy, France. I'm sorry, it's cold. Uh, I found a plaque to a Margaret Ryan who married a James Dunn. She's on a plaque in Foley Street, Dublin. Cool. Um, and I'm not going to try and say that either. And I don't know how to spell it. So <laughs> not sure of her connection to our family, but found the marriage certificate at my aunt's house after she passed. Ooh, that's a little bit of a mystery, isn't it? And I'm, I'm going to apologize. I'm not totally sure how to pronounce your name either. Angel? 
I'm not sure. I'm going to ask my daughter though. She's in her third year of French. Um, and I'm sure she will teach it to me. Um, this is a very interesting little story you've got going here. I really want to know more about this. So if you ever find the connection, make sure to send it in to us and let us know. Um, but the fact that your aunt had her marriage certificate is really intriguing, isn't it? It's like one of those little pieces of ephemera that you, you, you inherit and you get as part of the collection and you're just not sure what to do with it. I have, I have a few of those myself. Um, interesting. Mary, Margaret Ryan, Mary James Dunn. Hmm. Very interesting story. Okay, good. I like that one. Um, right, right, right. Um, oh, Judith saying she also enjoyed the program on slavery records. I, yeah, um, I did as well. Actually, I had to watch it after the fact. Um, but so I watched it back, which is the incredible advantage of doing these on Facebook and YouTube and all that is that we have those recordings forever. So we can watch them whenever we want. Um, really, really interesting. And that record collection is, is, is also very interesting. Just even if you don't have anybody in it, right. You're not related to anybody. I think it's really important that we all learn about all the aspects of history um, without going too far down that path. Right. It's every story matters. Um, and that's, that's the stories that have already been told and the stories that have yet to be discovered. Um, and, and collections like this are the ones that help us do that. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Friday lives gives us a bit of me time. Dinner can wait. Yes. <laughs> totally agree, Gina. <laughs> Although for me, it's probably like breakfast, I guess. Um, okay. So Roots Tech highlights a couple of things that I wanted to share with the group. Um, it was, like I said at the beginning, it was really delightful to be just with everybody. I went to, I only got to a couple of different sessions, um, but um, there were some really interesting little little nuggets in there. Like um, I I went to a newspaper talk, um, how to research newspapers like a journalist. I think it was called that, something like that. I don't think it was one of the recorded ones. But one of the things she said that I have kind of been doing, but not in, not as intentionally as she um, she kind of made it sound. Um, was to look in, like, if you're looking for a certain type of newspaper article, like, let's say you're looking for an obituary, create a list of synonyms that relate to obituaries and death, and search for all of those as keywords in the newspaper sites. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's really smart, actually. So you you kind of are doing it, right? But you don't really think about how you're doing it. Um, the other example that she used was, you know, like, we could, we could do that with military records, right? So how many ways can you write out the word lieutenant? or abbreviate lieutenant and and understanding how the newspaper would have actually done that. And so once you find a new, you find your person or a story in the paper that you're interested in, then you see what their style is and you go okay, this newspaper uses l i e u t period. And so your search should be based on that format of that abbreviation whereas another newspaper might just say lt, right? So it yeah, some nuances there that I thought were really interesting. Um, one of the coolest things that I brought away out of the expo hall, well, actually, no, two more updates, actually. So the first thing um, to share about my expo hall uh, experience was the large pile of treats that were brought to me by my colleagues from the UK. I got chocolates and, and the little gummies and Jaffa cakes, people. I haven't had a Jaffa cake in so long, and it was delightful. Um, and I am still enjoying those. Um, so shout out to my colleagues, Mary and um, Philly and Brian for bringing me treats um, from overseas and trekking them across the ocean. It's amazing. Love it. Love a Jaffa cake. Okay. And then the, <laughs> the other thing that I wanted to share was this new tool. It's been out for a few months, I think. Um, but I really got my first experience with it. And I'm trying to find where I put it here. Um, I had it all queued up and ready for you guys. Um, and it's called Site Builder. Um, let me just pull this up. And I'm going to share my screen really quick, just to just so you can see it, really. Um, but it's a really, really cool site. Um, it's made by Jenny Joyce, who's down in Australia. She and her husband kind of came together during the pandemic and created this tool. And it actually build citations for us. So good. This thing is awesome. So they have a basic version and then they have a premium version that you can purchase, which really wasn't, I think it was um, like 15 Australian a year. And I was like, that's, you know, whoa, um, that's, it, it's really, really cool. So 
what you do is you can, there's templates and everything built in. Um, I would encourage you guys, if you struggle with citations at all, which let's be honest, all of us do, um, go in into the site and watch their little, their demo videos um, or join their Facebook group or something. Really, really cool um, website. Um, thanks, Karen, for saying, you know, you love it too. You've already found it. That's good. She shared the link with us um, in the comments. It's so good. Um, and so did Ellie. It, this, I, I think this is a game changer, honestly, for the industry. This was the most exciting thing I think I've see, I saw at RootsTech this year. I mean, there's lots of cool stuff coming out around stories and storytelling and doing all sorts of work in that area and that social history context, which you guys all know I love. But this takes the idea of building citations um, and moves it from complicated and intimidating to really simple. All you have to do is fill in the little pieces of information. It allows you to build citations in either the evidence explained format or the Strathclyde format because they require different, um, re they have a different set of requirements. Um, or uh, there's a third one that they have templates for and I can't remember now. Um, and they're taking feedback and input. So um, because the husband is the programmer and developer, like that, you know, that collaboration between the the creator of the site and the person actually building the site is is right there. Um, watch the the YouTube, get an idea of what it does for you. Once you created a citation, you just copy and paste it into whatever document you're working in, whether it's your your online tree on Find My Past, um, or if it's um, a, you know, a Word document or some kind of a writing software or a genealogy software, copy and paste it is really simple. So take a look at Site Builder, like really, really. Um, it's really good. And and Karen's saying, yeah, I used to use my own spreadsheet version, but this is so easy. To, and I'm the same, right? I have a, a spreadsheet that I've been keeping. And I and now I can build each of those into my account on Site Builder as a template, and I will just have it forever. It's great. Um, okay. So... Um, all right, let me just, oh, let me take this down, look at the comments a little bit, uh, some chat about the talks at Roots Text, that's good. Yet lots of presentations about storytelling um, and tools. Um, and that was, uh, you know, a real obvious big focus for um, for a lot of people was was storytelling and how to kind of capture those moments. So, um, so it'll be interesting to see how that develops across the industry, I think. Um, do, do, do. Okay, let's talk about question of the week. Uh, for a few minutes and then, yep, I should have time. I'm going to, I still want to do a live demo today too. Um, so Andrew gave us, got us started today. A shout out to the enumerator who didn't care about gender. <laughs> um, the woman I was researching was a seamster. Oh, that's yeah. Okay, cool. I like it. Um, that's, that's great, actually. <laughs> That's a good one, Andrew. That's a good story. Um, Judith has two female convict ancestors. Um, always an interesting route of research, right? Um, I have, I don't have any convicts that I know of, um, but I do have at least two indentured servants that were brought over to the American colonies. Um, so that's always been, you know, that's that's a good one to dig into as well. Kind of on a similar vein, similar but different. Um, Gina says, you have to admire female ancestors that brought, bought up large families, sometimes alone because the men were away at war. Absolutely. And and yeah, I military families tend to be quite big, I think. Um, and I think that's true for the Napoleonic Wars, um, but also moving into World War One and Two, um, you know, you see that a lot. It starts to kind of decline a little bit during World War Two, I think. But even through World War One, we're seeing some really big families. So, yeah, really good call, Gina. Um, Colleen's got a rumor. I discovered a rumor. I'd always heard that my great grandmother was a bootlegger. Oh, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> and assisted her brother in running a speakeasy. That's so amazing. <laughs> Stuff like that is really like. I don't want my ancestors to be calm and normal and like well-respecting citizens, right? Like I want them to be troublemakers uh, so much. So not too much trouble, just enough to make it interesting. <laughs> um, Anya, a relative I haven't gone on about before. So a new one. That's good. Thanks, Anya. Uh, my two times great grandfather, stepmother. Two times great grand. Yeah. Okay. Got it. I found that she was sent to prison in Wales in the 1870s, not long after the birth of her second child. And in the newspapers on Find My Past, I found that she was convicted for something she hadn't done. 
um, but they realized she was innocent and was still stuck in prison. And they were talking in the papers about her being falsely imprisoned. Oh my gosh, I have to know the rest of the story. Anya, what happened to her? Did she get out of prison? Did she die? What happened? What happened? What happened? I want to know. You have to finish this one. <laughs> That's a good story. I love this. Kim saying, most of my female ancestors were non-traditional. <laughs> <laughs> especially on my mom's side some did good but mostly they were wrong uns. uh yeah good um we want to know details though spill the tea yeah <laughs> let's hear it um sally i had a great aunt who lived on the isle of Wight during world war ii she was in the land army cool after the war of a very few girls were selected and taken to London and were presented to the Queen. Oh, that's very cool. Who, of course, thanked them for their efforts. I think that's quite special. I do, too. You know, um, yeah, I know there's lots of different opinions out there, of course, about royalty and the royal family and what that means. But, um, but just thinking back about our ancestors' experiences, something like that is incredibly unique. And, and a moment in history that probably hadn't been that hadn't occurred very often before, right? I mean, we can point to particular like women soldiers or warriors, even if we go way back and their acknowledgement by someone in charge, but a formal acknowledgement from the queen during a global war, that's pretty dang special. I'm sure it happened in World War I too, because there was certainly women involved in the World War I effort. Um, but I don't know, it, that, that is definitely a moment to capture, right? I think that's pretty neat. Um, Ellen saying her third great grand aunt was not only a teacher at the Wesleyan female college from 1842 until 59, she was an accomplished equ equestrian, often riding 50 miles in a day. Whew. Uh, that makes me sore just kind of thinking about it and was a, a published poet as well. Oh yeah. Got to find some of her poetry. You absolutely should Ellen. Yes. That's really cool. Um, what a passion for horses too. And, and just all there's a lot there to kind of unwrap that's a cool story that's a very that seems to be a, a very cool person um oh anya's got a little follow-up for us thank you anya she got out of prison but it took them a while to actually release her she and my three times great grandfather had many more children and moved from wales to lancashire all right cool all right um oh this is a good story to trace too sue's telling us that her uh, maternal grandmother was apparently involved in the uprising in Dublin in 1916, but I haven't found any evidence so far, something to work on. That's cool. All right, cool. Um, some very good stories and comments. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, I want to do, I want to make sure I have time for a little bit of a live demo. Um, so I'm going to do that. And then, and then if we have time afterwards, we'll come back to, um, to more of these stories because they're fantastic. All right. So let me, um, share my screen again. What we're going to do is thinking about the women in our family, we're going to kind of go back to the basics here. Um, but I think it's an important one to look at. So we're going to look at identifying women using very limited information. We're going to do that through the birth, marriage, death, and parish records collection on Find My Past. Okay. So if you um, go to this particular um, search page. This is not just the all like search everything at once page. This is a specific search page just for this category of records. And I think that's really important to emphasize, right? You see it highlighted over here on the side, birth, marriage, death, and parish records. When you are searching for something specific, you want to, like, that's why these these categories and subcategories are built into the Find My Past system. I'm going to share the link. Um, or Ellie, can you share the link really quick? Do you have it? Okay, cool. Um, thanks, Ellie. So use the categories and subcategories to your advantage, right? They're there for a reason. So when you're looking for um, women in particular, right, these subcategories can really be very powerful. So the first thing I'm going to do if I'm, if I'm looking for someone, um, and I got to pull my notes up at the same time so I don't get distracted by what I'm saying here. The first thing I'm going to do actually is minimize to a subcategory. Um, and I'm going to do that just by clicking on civil marriage and divorce. Okay. Really? I mean, so that's my subcategory inside my larger record category. And the reason I want to do that is because the subcategory search pages include, um, search filters, it's still thinking, include search filters that aren't included, that are not on kind of the more generic general search pages, okay? They are search pages that are designed specifically for that type of record. Um, and that's, 
important to remember, right? If you look at the military collection, you'll see the same thing. There is a search filter there to type in the soldier's service number. And that's not available on the general kind of search everything pages because it's, it's specific to that type of record. So you want to be looking for these subcategory search pages that help you kind of narrow down the search process. Um, so we're going to take you through an example. Now, this one, I, I have it prepped, obviously, so I know what's going to happen. Um, <laughs> but we're going to, what I know about this person is that the first name of this woman is Julia, and I know her husband's last name, but I'm trying to figure out what her maiden name is. Okay, so her first name is Julia. We're going to type that in. And of course, there's, you know, a lot of them, 489,000 of them across the collection. But I know her husband's surname, and it happens to be a bit of an unusual one, so that helps. Um, but her husband's surname is Reichel, R-E-I-C-H-E-L. You can tell I've searched for this before. And it actually narrows it down immediately to one result. Okay, cool. So we know also that they married around 1885. But we um, don't even have to enter this in this example. You absolutely could, though, filter by a, a year, right? So you could say 1885 here. And you could even filter by a location. So let's say the husband's surname is Brown, right? You want to kind of narrow that down as much as you can. So you can use the location filter and the search radius to kind of bring that, that list of results in tighter. The, the the thing that you need to remember and the thing that it actually maybe took me a little longer than I wanted it to to really understand and appreciate and internalize in my research process is that we really can trust the GRO index. Um, one of our dear friends at the National Archives, Audrey Collins, who recently passed away, and I wasn't going to talk about her today, but I'm going to now, she made a comment. Um, about two or three years ago, I think that really has stuck with me. And you know, someone asked her, "Can can you really trust the GRO index? Is it really that comprehensive?" And what she said was, "Except for those first few years when people were adjusting to this new system, yes, you absolutely can trust the GRO. If it's not in there, something is really wrong, right?" And because a lot of the search results in these civil, um, birth, death, and marriage categories are built off of the GRO and indexes like it, we know that we can trust the results that we're getting with this kind of information and this kind of search. So when we look at our one result, um, it is in fact the couple that we're looking for, um, but we're gonna, we're gonna let it load. It's, it's gonna do it. A live demo is always the risk of a live demo. Of course, it's my Wi-Fi is gonna be slow today, right? So we see um, that we have Julia here. Her last um, last name is listed as Ashendem. Um, the year is 1887, and that aligns with what we thought, right? We thought they were married around 1885. I wasn't actually really sure where the marriage took place, but I had a feeling it was in the London area, just based on where the family was living kind of after the fact. Um, but when we go in and look at this um, uh, transcription, right, we can take advantage of the fact that Find My Past has the marriage finder tool, right? And this is something that, um, as far as I'm aware, at least, I haven't checked in a while, that, um, that Find My Past offers um, the that uh, is unique to find my past. Um, so we see Julia's full name, Julia Maria H. L. Ashendem. It took me a little while to figure out what her real full name was. Um, married in 1887 in the second quarter. And one of these two people is her spouse, right? So Oswald Joseph Reichel or John Smith Cottrell. Now we already know that the husband's surname is Reichel. So we know it's Oswald here. And that actually aligns with the rest of my research. Um, so I'm confident this is actually the right marriage, but because of the unique search filters and, and capabilities we have built into the subcategory, and because of the power of the GRO, and then you add in the marriage finder on top of that, you have three really strong capabilities and functions within the site that give us a lot of ability to be very confident in our search results. Um, so then of course, from here, you would order the marriage certificate and really confirm with evidence um, that, that this is in fact the correct marriage and the correct people. And she has quite a name, right? So we need to understand um, kind of a little bit about her background and where she comes from and her parents and that kind of thing to understand why she has such a long, complicated name. But if you are looking for someone named, you know, you find a newspaper article that just says Mrs. L. Thompson, and you want to try and figure out who she really was, these features allow us to do that in a way that 
really hasn't been available to us before, right? And and some of these features have been on the site for a long time, but if you are still kind of struggling with the idea of how to even narrow down the needle in the haystack, this way is just a, a great way of doing that, right? So go to the subcategory, look for civil marriage, put in the information that you know, and even if it generates a list of 10 um, possible options, that's better than a list of you know, 3 million, right? Um, so it's easier to manage and easier to handle. And then you can kind of go through that process of elimination and say, well, which one of these is more likely to be the couple I'm interested in? And then you can start marrying, you know, or ordering the uh, marriage certificates and and that kind of thing from the, from, um, from the archive and the record office. So, um, yeah, so all of that, just to say, like, take advantage of, these tools that are built into the site, right? Think about the subcategory that you're working with. Think about the special search filters. Think about the strength of the GRO. And and, and maybe it um, is obvious to everyone else in the room, but for me as, as a US trained genealogist, the GRO is really unique and special. Most countries don't have that type of index. Um, you know, certainly in the United States, there is no national database. Um, there sometimes isn't even like a state level list uh, or index that's been created. Um, and Canada, I believe, is the same way in terms of they don't have like a national um, level organization like that. It's province by province. Um, so consider yourselves, you know, you have a bit of an advantage if you're doing research in England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland, because you have these systems in place and you have had for so long. Um, it, it's really quite fortunate, right? And it, it is a powerful tool. So we need to be able to kind of take advantage of that and trust that. All right, that's my live demo for today. Um, I know it sounds really basic. And for some of you, you probably, you know, work, do that all the time and, and, and pop up, you know, it pops up frequently, right? And it's a tool that you take advantage of all the time. But every time I do that, I'm reminded of how cool it is. And just like, it just makes things so much more efficient and easy and straightforward. And it's just great. Okay. So we've got a 10 minutes or so left. We're going to take advantage of that time. We've got a couple more question of the week responses and some stories to share. So please don't stop. Um, keep throwing those comments in. We're going to go back to in gel. Uh, gosh, I really just feel like I'm really butchering that. Um, but she has said her grandmother, who she never met, died before she was born, um, was a dancer before she married in 1911. Oh, that, yeah. She's had this from three separate sources, but can't find anything on her at all. There's supposed to be a painting of her in her dress attire. Oh, that would be incredible. Um, I believe that she may have married my grandfather bigamously because her first husband disappeared off to America. Oh my goodness. She marries second saying she's a widow in 1938 and her first husband I have tracked in the U S has remarried in 1940 saying he, where's the rest of it? Um, Oh, it gets cut off. Ugh. I want to know the rest. Um, but it sounds like a fascinating story. Um, yeah, I don't see, I, maybe you guys can see it on the Facebook side. Um, Ellie is going to help me out here. Um, so we will cliffhanger. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, let's see what else is. Oh, Daphne says I'll have a demo. That's good. Um, okay, Liam. Liam, making a reference to Blue Peter. Uh, you're going to have to explain that to me because, nope, you're right. I don't get it. Too British. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, my find my past colleagues know exactly where my line is, I feel like. Um, do, do, do. okay, Ellie's got the rest of it for me. And the, 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 she's saying he is a widower in 1940, in the 1940 census. Okay, interesting. So, just that one word got cut off, Ellie. That's slightly annoying. <laughs> So, all right, let's, let's retrace this. Um, so the grandmother she's never met um, was possibly a dancer. There might be a painter, a painting, um, and she may have married grandfather bigamously because the first husband ran off to America as husbands tend to do. Uh, um, she marries a second time saying she's a widow. And then he is in the 1940 census remarried and saying he's a widower. So no official divorce sounds like, um, 
which, you know, to be honest, isn't really that uncommon, I don't think. Um, but always, but a good story, a very, very good story. So thank you for sharing that with us. And again, as I always say, uh, if you happen to chase it up and you find something else, do let us know. Um, okay. And then there's some conversation going on here about military records. I'm going to let Ellie and Anya <laughs> chat through that. It sounds interesting. Something about the Royal Artillery in Egypt. Very good. Um, yeah, this. This is exactly what I was trying to say, Kim. Thanks. The people of the time didn't always trust the new system when it came to the GRO. Um, my great uncle's mother was never, uh, their birth was never registered in 1884, 85, but was baptized instead. Really good suggestion and very strong, well worded there. Like, if you don't find it in the civil, go to the parish or vice versa. Um, and, um, and, and see if you can find it in, in the opposite. But again, that's, that's why I feel like you're so lucky in the UK to have both resources, right? Um, it's such an incredible tool um, and one that even though is routine, we really shouldn't overlook. Um, do, do, do. Some... Um, oh, this is a good suggestion, actually, Daphne. Wouldn't it be great if these live demos were put on a separate playlist? We are, Ellie is giving me a thumbs up. We are writing this down and we are going to take that and see what we can do about it. Um, it's a really good idea. Um, fantastic. So we will, we will see what we can action there. Um, all right. Um, that looks like it for the question of the week stories. Um, thank you all so much for sharing as per usual. That's great. We did a live demo. We talked about new records. We talked about Roots Tech. Um, there was lots of chat I saw about some of the online sessions. So that's good. Um, and we are just about at the top of the hour. So Oh, interesting. Andrew saying, I found newspaper ads explaining that baptisms did not trump civil registration. That's another one. We should, yeah, Ellie's giving me that mm, face. Um, we should look into that too, Ellie. That's be, um, let's send that one over to Rose and see if we can get a story out of that. That would be really good help content, I think, on the blog. Um, Andrew, if you're interested in sending us some examples or possibly drafting a guest blog, we would be delighted with that as well. So just putting that in your brain and seeing if that comes to, it comes to anything. We're always happy to take great stories and examples like that. Okay. Let me just go back and check and make sure I, I have covered off everything I wanted to talk about today. Uh, and I think that I have, but let's just recap really quickly. Um, this week's new records, the Lancashire Barrow and Furnace Shipbuilding and Engineering Employees, um, the commemorative plaques from the UK, but don't forget about their bigger website um, at Open Plaques um, is what it's called. If you just use your favorite search engine for Open Plaques, you should find it right away. Really incredible, massive kind of global list of historical plaques. Take a look at that. Combine it with your house history and the address search on Find My Past. It's a great tool. Uh, newspaper publishing, just a quick break. We'll be back next week with more great newspaper, new, huh, newspaper content. Um, don't forget to watch back the legacies of British slavery discussion that happened earlier this week. Find it on our Facebook and YouTube channels. It really was a great discussion. Uh, we had a guest from UCL, um, uh, with Ellie doing that. So really do take some time to watch that and learn a bit about the, those records and, and what they're doing there. Um, and then my last piece today for the day, go get yourself a Jaffa cake this weekend. Really delightful. Yeah. Um, somebody made a comment very early on about my bookends, giving a little compliment. I just want to acknowledge that. They're over here. That was harder than it should have been. Um, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, Jaffa cakes, right? Um, have a fantastic weekend, everybody. Uh, get some research in. Um, we love being here with you, but we love even more when you share your stories, either on our Facebook page or on the Find My Past forum. So um, make sure that you're active there and you're participating. Uh, and then again, um, if you have suggestions or questions, feel free to send those in. We'd always love to hear from you. Let me see if I can find that. And you can email us at discoveries at findmypast.com. Um, and um, we're always, always anxious to hear from you um, in whatever format you want to send that to us. So um, be do, you know, be sure to, to share with us. Um, go back to the comments really quick. Uh, da, da, da. 
lots of different flavors of Jaffa cakes. I don't think I knew that. I think I just knew about the one. All right. Well, I am going back over to the UK in April, so I will be sure to hit the store and see what I can find. Um, somebody asked, where are all my Hamilton figures? They are actually still behind me. Um, nope, wrong direction. They're just, they just got moved down a shelf. I'm, I'm reconfiguring and I put some lights back in here and I got to figure that out. Probably by the next time you see me, there'll be some lights shining up. I don't know exactly how sure yet all right thanks everybody have a great weekend um enjoy the new records do some research talk about your family history share some stories with the people you love and um and we will be back next week so thanks very much and have a great evening afternoon day wherever you are <laughs>